On July the 15th, 2008, Ronaldinho sealed a 21 million euro move from Barcelona to AC Milan. Another big money transfer for the former World Player of the Year, but this time the Brazilian was at a crossroads in his career. After so much time playing in Spain, I decided I needed a change. I settled upon Milan because the club has one of the best setups in the world. Some really great players, and they're one of the best teams in the world, too. His game's changed, but Ronaldinho's still young. He needs to be loved again. The fans abandoned him. So, has the world seen the best of Ronaldinho? He certainly won everything there is to win for club and country, but the old inspiration isn't there. Does the once brilliant Brazilian have the desire to prove himself once again? I want to believe that he does. I'm praying he does, because he's a spectacular player. I love watching Ronaldinho play. But my big fear is he's become much more of a showman than a footballer. Ronaldinho, after all, inspired Barcelona to back-to-back -back Primera Ligas and a Champions League title. It was all done with his familiar, intoxicating inspiration. I think he did so much at Barcelona that people always expect more and more. Sometimes that's just not possible. You can only do so much. You're only human. Ronaldinho, perhaps the most gifted player of his generation. Between 2004 and 2006, Ronaldinho redefined football. He combined vision, touch and invention with steely determination, inspiring Barcelona to title after title. It was a joy to watch him and uh, he, he, he was one of the guys that made the public came to the stadium. It looked like he was always happy and content on the pitch and the only thing he wanted to do was play, play his game. I think that no one has played as beautifully as Ronaldinho in the past 10 years. He was able to achieve those big wins, leading Barcelona to the Spanish title, helping them win the Champions League. He was able to give them that most important element, but at the same time, he'd always do it with a smile on his face. Here in Brazil's southernmost city of Porto Alegre is where Ronaldinho's story begins. Born in the relatively poor suburb of Vila Nova in March 1980, Ronaldo de Assis Moreira seemed destined to become a footballer. Ever since I was a little boy, I've loved playing football. It's a gift that God gave me and I'm just happy to make a living out of it. A talent for football ran in the family. His brother, Assis, starred for the local club Gremio in the early 90s until his career was cut short by injury. Assis was an important role model to his younger brother. Everyone knew about Assis at Gremio and he played for Brazil at every youth age group. So everyone knew about him. Just imagine what it was like for Ronaldinho at home watching his brother do all this. So I think the greatest inspiration was his brother, Assis. Ronaldinho was quick to follow in his older brother's footsteps, playing futsal at Gremio from the age of seven. Even as a youngster, he showed a precocious talent and soon established himself at the club he supported. For so many years, Gremio was the beginning of everything. I owe the club a lot. From the age of seven to the age of 21, it was a great start in football. Were you a fan? I still am today. What he does today, he was doing back then at the age of 12 or 13. Everyone at Gremio and in the south of Brazil knew that Ronaldinho was going to be a great, great player. As well as his brother, the young Ronaldinho had another hero, Rivellino, one of Brazil's stars of the 70s. I'd always watch loads of videos of him and I'd imagine myself being Rivellino. And then I wanted to be left-footed too, like Rivellino, and then Maradona. And my brother as well. 
practically all my heroes were left-footed. Rivellino was, and still is, one of my biggest football heroes. For all the tricks and flicks he learned from watching his heroes, Ronaldinho was no stranger to hard work. If he could play after training had finished, then he would. We'd leave and go to Restinga, where I lived, and then play football again. His life has always been about football. Having won the Under-17 World Cup with Brazil in 1997, Ronaldinho returned to Grêmio, ready for first-team action. The teenager was an instant hit with the fans. Despite his skinny frame, he adapted to the tough regional championship well and impressed the supporters with his eye for goal and an extraordinary touch. The South Brazilian regional championship is the most similar to European football. A lot less fouls are given and it's more aggressive than other championships. And I think that made a big difference to Ronaldinho's career. Like many great players, Ronaldinho produced his best performances in the biggest games. Grêmio's bitter rivals were Internacional and Ronaldinho always excelled against them. So much so that the nation took notice. He first caught the eye in the Grêmio Internacional derby, in a regional final, when he famously dribbled past Dunga. And it seems, even to this day, Dunga hasn't forgiven him. And that's when everyone said, my God, who is this kid? What a confident kid to do that to the 94 World Cup winning captain. It wasn't long before Vandele Luxemburgo called him up to the Brazilian national squad. And to help him settle in, Ronaldinho was to share a room with the captain and former Grêmio teammate, Emerson. Generally, a young player is a little shy or afraid of speaking to anyone. And I think I helped him feel at home, especially as I was also from the south of Brazil and had played for the same club. He took to international football easily enough, though, and he looked every inch a Brazil player when he scored in 1999 against Venezuela in the Copa América. There was that moment against Venezuela when he came on as a substitute and scored that now famous goal. The opposition was poor, but the goal itself was spectacular. Suddenly the kid from Villanova was a star, but perhaps he'd outgrown his southern Brazilian origins. When Paris Saint-Germain expressed an interest, Ronaldinho had to go. I think Ronaldinho is the greatest player to come out of Rio Grande do Sul and one of the greatest in Brazil. However, I think the region hasn't recognised that fact. The fans turned on their hero, though, when they learned he'd signed for PSG on a free transfer, taking advantage of the Bosman law. The love affair between Ronaldinho and his hometown club was over. That was more of a fans thing. He was labelled a mercenary because Grêmio did not receive a transfer fee. Because in Brazil we don't have a Bosman law, and in Europe they do. Ronaldinho didn't hurt anyone. He didn't rob anyone. He didn't take money from anyone. He did everything within the laws of the game. These days it happens all the time and no one gets upset about it. After a few months in exile at Grêmio, Ronaldinho settled in the French capital surprisingly easily. He was still far from the complete player, but he showed flashes of genius that promised much for the future. Still, though, there was work to be done. He needed to work to progress. In the first year, he understood this. And, in his own mind, he really tried. He had that genius. He had an incisive gift on the field. And we, the coaching staff and the fans, were helping him to become even better. It was a great learning process there. 
It was my first club outside Brazil, and so I learned an entirely new culture and a new type of football. It was a really important stage in my life. Once again, Ronaldinho came alive in the big games, but he struggled for consistency. Generally, he was good in the important matches against the likes of Marseille, but he knew how to choose his moments. In the big ones, he was very good, but in the others, which were less important, he just wasn't as interested. As the four times world champions travelled to the 2002 World Cup in Japan and Korea, the pressure wasn't as intense as it might have been. I think we left the country with little faith in us, especially from the point of view of the press and also the fans. We hadn't done well in qualification, but we were always confident and were able to prove people wrong. Without the pressure of being tournament favourites, Brazil were able to express themselves. Ronaldinho played alongside Ronaldo and Rivaldo in an attacking trio, and the youngster blossomed in such celebrated company. We had players like Rivaldo, Ronaldo and Cafu and obviously other great players. And I think that helped Ronaldinho, because although it didn't take all the responsibility off his shoulders, he could at least share it with the others. And so I think he played with more freedom. It was the quarter-final against England when Ronaldinho truly left his mark on the competition. Michael Owen opened the scoring for England before a brilliant run from Ronaldinho led to Rivaldo's equaliser on the stroke of half-time. Then five minutes into the second half, a stroke of genius from the 22-year-old. I'm telling you, he meant it. All of us argued about it for ages. We were saying, no, it must have been a cross. But before he took that free kick, he turned around. And I think he said to Belletti, keep your eye on the goalkeeper, he'll come off his line. He definitely was shooting. He couldn't have hit it so perfectly if he hadn't been. It was a delicate moment, and that's when Ronaldinho's star shone for us. That's why these guys are geniuses, capable of something special, and were born to play football. And they had these fortunate moments too. I was fortunate enough to score that fantastic goal and help Brazil win the World Cup. Despite later getting sent off for a foul, Ronaldinho's goal had restored belief to a shaky Brazilian side. Admittedly, he was stupid getting sent off against England, but then he did score that ridiculous goal. And that was in a game where the whole country thought we'd lose, because we thought England were better than Brazil. Brazil never looked back. They overcame Turkey in the semi-finals, which meant they were to face Germany in the final. Two goals from Ronaldo gave the Brazilians a 2-0 win and a record fifth World Cup. Ronaldinho was voted the tournament's best midfield player. The youngster from Porto Alegre had come a long way. Becoming a World Cup winner was a dream come true. As soon as I started playing football, I'd imagine myself in a Grêmio shirt and then in a Brazil one. And then I'd picture myself winning the World Cup with Brazil, so it really was a dream come true. Back at Paris Saint-Germain, however, things weren't going quite so well. His inconsistent form was still an issue, and manager Luis Fernandes complained that the Brazilian was more interested in the Parisian nightlife than turning out for Paris Saint-Germain. Had that World Cup win gone to Ronaldinho's head? When he came back to us for the second year, it wasn't the same. 
In his mind, he was a world champion. His family were not here. They had gone back to Brazil and he was alone. So it was difficult for me, for the club and his teammates. Because it was the same Ronaldinho, but it was a different player. Which was a shame because we gave him a lot. It was time to move on. Europe's top clubs queued up for Ronaldinho's signature in 2003 and eventually he decided that his future lay in Spain with Barcelona. Ronaldinho was to be the star who would revitalise the Catalan giants. He came at a moment that um, a few people believed in the, in the possibilities of Barca and he gave the, the people the, yeah, a way uh, to hope and, and, and believe in a new team to win important things. His impact was immediate. I think it was a case of either here, I show what I can do and gain the respect of the whole world, or just stay and be a millionaire. Like another Denilson, someone good at this circus, a trickster, but not a footballer. The tricks were no longer for show. Ronaldinho was becoming a decisive player, scoring crucial goals at crucial moments. I must say he's one of the, the few players I saw uh, in my life that, that made a difference and that could make a difference and did it in a very natural way. Under the management of Dutch legend Frank Rijkaard, Barcelona became unstoppable. And in Ronaldinho, they had the symbol of Rijkaard's attacking football philosophy. In just his second season, he helped Barca to their first league title in six years. It was the culmination of all my hard work. I managed to win virtually everything there is to win in football there. It's a period in my life that I'll never forget. What he combined was, was pace and uh, technically very, very skillful. He was able to control the ball and at the same time leave one or two or three opponents behind and uh, do wonderful things. It's difficult talking about myself, but I like to dribble with the ball to create chances. I always think of myself as a very creative player. I don't have to talk about the things he can do with a ball. He's got incredible vision. He picks out his pass before the ball has even reached him. I know very few players who can do that. Great, great player. And if there was one match that encapsulated the genius of Ronaldinho, it came against Real Madrid in November 2005, when he destroyed Barcelona's bitter rivals at their own ground. A month later, naturally, it was Ronaldinho who won Europe's most prestigious individual award. It was a unanimous Ballon d'Or in 2005, and he could well have won another one, but I just don't think he had the discipline. World Player of the Year in 2004 and 5, he then helped Barcelona to a second successive title in 2006. It seemed Ronaldinho had the Midas touch. All the titles were great, the Primera Liga, the Cup, everything I won with Barcelona was significant to me. There was one trophy that Ronaldinho and Barcelona still craved, the Champions League. But 2005-06 was to change all that as the Brazilian inspired his team to play some of the best football Europe has ever seen. I think that was a great period in football. He revolutionised the game. Because since then, more and more technical players have been emerging. And we have so many great players today. Dribbling and playing in an artistic way. Barcelona faced Arsenal in the 2006 Champions League final. Despite going a goal down early on, they came back to win 2-1 and seal a memorable year with a memorable triumph. Ronaldinho in particular was the hero of Catalonia. He was treated like a king in Barcelona for two years. And that's everything an artist could wish for. It's like getting on stage and the whole audience is focused on you, singing your songs, without even opening your mouth. Every song, 
That's the best feeling. But Ronaldinho struggled to replicate his club form for his country. The 2006 World Cup should have been Ronaldinho's chance to shine. But while he was the undisputed king of Barcelona, with Brazil, he had to settle for a supporting role amongst a lineup of stars. It's different playing in the national team. You have to share the attention with the other players, as it's all the stars playing together. It's much easier being the only star, but when you get together with all the others, you have to have more than just football. And I think that Ronaldinho's attraction is limited just to the football pitch. Ronaldinho wasn't born to be the main player in a team. He was born to be an extraordinary teammate. When people wanted to make him the star man, he couldn't cope. Brazil began with four wins, but their performances were unconvincing, and Ronaldinho looked a shadow of the player who'd been terrorizing European defenses all season. What happened in the 2006 World Cup? He should have been the star player. But he looked almost afraid to be playing alongside Ronaldo and Kaká. He wanted to be one of the others. People expected him to lead that team, and he didn't. I don't think he ever will. A 1-0 defeat to France in the quarter-finals ended Brazil's hopes of justifying their status as tournament favourites. Their performance was heavily criticised back in Brazil, and as the man who carried a nation's hopes on his shoulders, Ronaldinho was singled out. That's football. When you win, you get compliments. When you lose, you get criticised. Back at Barcelona, Ronaldinho, the superstar footballer, suddenly appeared far less invincible, more human. Not for the first time in his career, his levels of desire and motivation were called into question. He was great in the first year, the second too. But in the third and fourth years, it was the same story as in Paris. Rijkaard couldn't get him to play. Frank Rijkaard had the same problem as I had in Paris with Ronaldinho. You can't always say it's my fault or Rijkaard's fault. Overall, I, I, I didn't have too many problems with uh, Ronaldinho because he was a great guy, worked really well and uh, had a good relationship with his teammates. Only the last seasons it was getting uh, downwards and uh, yeah, he performed less. Ronaldinho was still a hugely marketable figure, but perhaps he'd begun to embrace that celebrity culture a little too much, and many feared that his lifestyle was not helping his football. This is what I'm talking about when I say he's become like a pop star or a marketing tool. He's thinking more about the adverts he does, thinking, I need to do what I do in the adverts on the pitch. It's confusing. You end up confusing the two roles. Challenge to revive his career. The only thing that surprised me once in a while is when, when he didn't have quite his day, his level could drop enormously. And if you think about that, you, you can say immediately that he, he is a really a very sensitive guy. I think that that's important for, for some guys that they that they feel that they are loved and liked and appreciated. The sort of adulation he received doesn't last for very long. Ronaldinho had it for about two years. Now he's in that needy phase. He lost the love, so he lost everything. That's the passion that he's trying to evoke once more at Milan. It's been a promising start to his career in Italy, and who knows, Ronaldinho may be able to reach the top once again. We're already seeing the Ronaldinho that we're used to seeing. The Ronaldinho who does his dribbles or impossible tricks. And I do believe he'll get back to that level. His performances with Milan led to a recall to the Brazilian side too. Now a veteran of the national side, it's hoped his enthusiasm for the game can rub off on Brazil's latest generation of talented players. 
I think there are a few players out there who love playing football quite like he does. He enjoys it more than anyone. He wants to play again and again. The guy just loves football.